Welcome to our webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST as we call it. My name is Christy Miner. I am the coordinator for the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice here at CCAST. The CCAST team launched this community practice in May of 2020 with the aim of facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through workshops and webinars like today's and by developing decision support tools to improve our ability to address introduced species. If you would like more information on CCAST or on our community practice, feel free to email me or Matt Graybaugh directly. I'm going to drop our emails in the chat. Today, we are hosting a presentation from John Findison, who will discuss giant salvinia removal in Lake Raven, Texas. John is currently an aquatic invasive species biologist for the Tex Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, specializing in aquatic vegetation management. He has worked for TPWD for almost 25 years, with the first 20 years as a fisheries management biologist. John received his bachelor's degree from Texas A&M University in 1992 and his master's from Southwest Texas State University, which is now Texas State University in 1997. Just one final reminder before I turn it over to John, um, if you have questions, like I said, during the presentation, please enter them into the chat box and I will relay them to John after the presentation. And with that, John, I think we are ready for you. So I will give you the floor. Thanks, Christy. As Christy stated, my name is John Van Dyson. I'm a aquatic invasive species biologist for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department uh, with the primary uh, task of handling the state of Texas uh, aquatic vegetation treatment uh, throughout the state. Uh, <clears throat> in Texas, we have 254 counties, uh, second largest state in the, in the, the nation and, and quite a bit to do considering there's only six of us that uh, uh, do this type of work on uh, public waters. All six of us are all located in the same office here in Brooklyn, Texas. Uh, just give you an idea though, uh, on, the, on the introduction slide here, uh, what you see is, uh, it looks like a field, a hay field almost. Uh, that's actually a four acre borrow pit uh, that the Corps of Engineers used to uh, build up a road to, to put a bridge across uh, Sam Rayburn Reservoir. Uh, the, the grass you see on top of that is one of the nut sedges we have out here, but underneath that nut sedge the, and the support of it is a uh, giant salvinia. The salvinia was thick enough uh, in this area that it would support a 10 pound weight. Uh, the water underneath that is 20 feet deep, but just by looking at it, you can't tell. And this is just one of, of a series of problematic lakes we have in Texas with salvinia. Uh, so we'll talk about Lake Raven today. Uh, lake Raven is, is a unique lake. It's 203 acre reservoir uh, located within Huntsville State Park. Uh, and it's just uh, located south, just south of the city of Huntsville and approximately one hour north of Houston. The major attractions uh, to the park itself are, this lake actually is an excellent bass and sunfish fishing or provides sunfish fishing opportunities. Uh, as well as it's a, a very popular state park in both aquatic and terrestrial activities. Uh, this is one of them that you have to actually get your park reservations several days or even weeks ahead to be able to attend. Uh, some of the current research going on uh, through the Inland Fisheries Division is we do have a channel catfish uh, spawning project going on on this reservoir. And in the past, uh, this reservoir was used as a Sherlunker study lake where we released uh, our Sherlunker strain uh, fingerlings in it and then went back later and collected them uh, as, as part of the Sherry Lunker program to look at growth. So from public use opportunities on this, uh, from, on the reservoir side of it, uh, obviously angling, I mean you can see it not only is it a good bass and sunfish lake, but the, but the large blue catfish here. Uh, we also <clears throat> have quite a few paddle sports uh, enthusiasts that utilize this lake. The entire lake is a no wake zone. Uh, so it makes it great for paddle boats, canoes, kayaks, and even paddle boards we see now. And the state park does rent uh, uh, paddle boats, canoes, and kayaks. 
Um, and then additionally, part of it is uh, the, the lake. One of the big draws is, is the swimming area here. Uh, and usually starting sometime into April, first part of May, all the way through probably the first of October, uh, that swim area is packed with people. So <clears throat> looking at Lake Raven, the map here, the green outline shows you the shoreline of the reservoir itself. It's approximately seven and a quarter miles long with three major, <clears throat> excuse me, three creeks that feed into the reservoir and then the dam in the lower uh, corner of it. The area highlighted in blue uh, is about 2.45 or two and a half acres of shoreline. And this is the area where the state park campsites are located. And these are gonna be both overnight campsites as well as day use sites. Uh, the, <clears throat> uh, and typically these are filled uh, throughout the year. And now moving uh, on, <clears throat> I'll put some pin drops uh, down on here. Uh, there is one boat ramp and it's located on the uh, yellow pin uh, on the west side of the lake. Uh, in addition to that, there is a, uh, a fishing pier. Uh, the other uh, pier, uh, yellow pin drop uh, is the second pier. And then I guess my third one didn't show up on this. So there's a total of three fishing piers on, on this uh, water body. Uh, in addition to that, the swimming area is denoted with the red pin, uh, and then the paddle craft dock is, is there with the green one. So some of the, the issues we have with our lakes in Texas and in this one uh, too are non-native uh, plants. Uh, giant salvinia is, is one of the biggest concerns we have on this lake, uh, just because it, it can take over so quick. Uh, the water hyacinth, we've had issues with water hyacinth in years past. Uh, hydrilla can be a big issue here and can cover almost 50% of the reservoir at times. Uh, and then we do have a little bit of alligator weed as well. Uh, all of these species have been managed for several decades uh, with various uh, means. Uh, and and we've been able to, to keep it back uh, to where it is, isn't much of an access problem, but occasionally the hydrilla uh, and even the salvinia and the water hyacinth can be problematic for boaters. Um, some of our native species in here, the American lotus, uh, white water lily, pickerel weed, bulrush, uh, and American pond weeds, uh, we, we'll find here and on, on the reservoir, and they provide quite a bit of habitat as well, especially back in the upper reaches of the three creek arms. So kind of going into some of the historical stuff uh, from a vegetation management standpoint, a lot of the, the old treatments were primarily herbicide treatments. Uh, they were conducted either targeting specific vegetation, that being water hyacinth, uh, uh, giant salvinia, or uh, the, the uh, hydrilla, uh, or occasionally there were there were times where there were whole lake treatments done, and specifically this was targeting hydrilla. Uh, however, with the herbicides used, uh, some of those uh, treatments or some the herbicides used would also get uh, water hyacinth and the salvinia. Uh, typically or historically, uh, these areas were treated once or twice a year. Uh, and, and one of the things we, we noticed a lot with this going back into the literature and then talking to some of the previous uh, managers of the reservoir is there was lots of collateral damage, uh, especially with these whole lake hydrilla treatments uh, and, and, and wiping out not just the hydrilla and the non-native species, but also removing our native plants for, for years at a time. And then finally, one of the biggest re things with this, though, is despite these efforts, the salvinia persisted uh, throughout the years, as well as a lot of the other plants, the water hyacinth and the hydrilla. Uh, <clears throat> you can see in the background, just past the airboat, there's a fringe of hyacinth. There's also salvinia mixed with it. And then in the foreground, you can see the uh, white water lily and then the, the uh, hydrilla as well. So kind of looking at, at some of the stuff that was used in the past, uh, the salvinia treatments uh, typically used uh, glyphosate, uh, either rodeo or aquanite. Uh, and then one year there was actually some experimental 
uh, treatments done using a, a mixture of stingray uh, contact herbicide uh, with rodeo to see yeah, if they could actually do get a better control with it. Uh, and then you look at the hydrilla controls that was using Aquathol K, uh, Sonar 1, and then some Aquathol Super K. Uh, there were several of the Sonar 1 treatments that were targeting, where we tried to target specific areas of the reservoir, and we had quite a bit of drift in uh, those areas, and it, it, we ended up wiping out a lot of the uh, plant community, both native and non-native. So looking back historically, uh, with the graph or the table here, uh, <clears throat> what you see the numbers uh, in black are represented the acres. So everything that's in yellow is going to be from six to 10 acres. Uh, the kind of pink orange color will be uh, from 10 to 20 acres. And then any treatments above 20 acres will be denoted in blue. Uh, you can see I went back and on our database goes back as far as 2012, 2013, and we didn't have any salvinia treatments. That's that the a big part of the table is for salvinia treatments. Uh, there is a line across the bottom that uh, shows the amount of hydrilla uh, that was treated annually on these lakes. Uh, obviously, 215 acres is larger than the 203 acres of the lake, so we did have a, a secondary treatment come in uh, in. Uh, 2012 for hydrilla. But going back in 2012, 2013, there were absolutely no directed efforts towards giant salvinia. Uh, 2014, we had 17 acres treated, uh, stayed about the same 2015, 2016. And then we start to see a little bit of a climb in the salvinia where it's starting to double in size. And then in January of 2018 in Texas, we had a, a, a Good uh, cold weather event come through, uh, drop temperatures down into the mid-teens. Uh, we thought that maybe the Salvinia had, uh, you know, succumbed to the, the cold weather and, and we wouldn't have to, to ever see it again at Lake Raven. Well, if you can look at the, or if you look at the September uh, treatment, I mean, that was one day of, of treatment and that was 39 acres uh, of Salvinia there. Uh, and then we did a follow-up treatment then in October to try to get it back under control. And uh, that, that was 10 acres. Also two, uh, these uh, hydrilla treatments, the, the first four here, the 215 acres, 107 acres, uh, nine acres and 34 acres, were used in the Aquathol K, the Aquathol Super K and the, the Sonar One. Uh, in 2018, uh, hydrilla treatments were then uh, are now being conducted using Priscillacor, and Pr Priscillacor is is not uh, very effective on salvinia. But you can see the amount of herbicides that was used uh, to treat hydrilla that also had major impacts on the salvinia. So we kind of we got to looking around. We we saw we knew that the salvinia was going to persist. Uh, we were starting to see it increase in the amount of salvinia we treated annually out there. Uh, so we, we went back to the drawing board on this and we we're like, okay, you know, if, if we're going to change this or change our management of salvinia, you know, what are we going to do? Well, one of the, the, the most important thing we, we wanted to continue to do is reduce the giant salvinia and do that lake wide. Uh, in the past, we had talked about some collateral damage, and that was one of the issues that that we was constantly brought up is that we need to minimize that best we can, and uh, especially damage to the the beneficial aquatic plants uh, within the reservoir. We also wanted to reduce the the chance of spread of giant salvinia from Lake Raven, and that meant that we were going to have to keep that boat ramp clean, uh, keep that plant from attaching to a trailer boat or other equipment and moving from Lake Raven to Lake Conroe, which already has salvinia, by uh, continuing to infest Conroe or even other lakes around the area uh, within a, a few hours drive. Uh, and finally, we had to, to make sure that we met the, the goals and objectives of the state parks and the uh, Inland Fisheries Division. Uh, the parks wanted to increase bank angler access, uh, especially along the uh, shorelines there at the campsites, and as well as recreational access. Uh, we didn't need a lot of salvinia piling up in the uh, paddle boat uh, rental 
uh, docks as, as well as in the uh, swimming area. And the one thing we need, really had to do was be careful uh, so that we didn't impact the excellent bass and sunfish fisheries. So well, what did we do? Well, that took us back to the basic parts of it. Let's look at an integrated pest management plan and see exactly what we can do. So we opened up the toolbox and we started looking at all the different tools we had. Obviously, the first one that comes to mind and the one we use the most historically were herbicides or chemicals. Uh, started looking at the idea of maybe rather than, than doing one or two treatments a year, what if we increase the frequency of that, maybe treat it every other month on it? Could we actually decrease uh, the amount of salvinia that, that was growing at one time? So we weren't having to go in and treat 40 acres in a day. Uh, we also wanted to look at contact versus systemic herbicides. What would be the best? Uh, and, and then in addition to that, start looking at potentially mixing these two. Is there a possibility and it, it, can we do it based off of the label, uh, mix herbicides, a contact herbicide with a systemic herbicide and get a better result? So now, now we started using some, then we started thinking about using some tools outside of what we did, had done historically, uh, using things like floating booms. Uh, can we, are there some areas that we can install floating booms? Uh, if there are, then are the state, would the state park allow that to happen? Because obviously that can decrease access to an area while we, we encourage people to go across the boom, it's still going to be difficult and fewer people may be accessing those areas. Uh, secondly, we had to decide, okay, are we going to spray behind that boom or basically use the boom as a containment? Or do we want to go in, let the salvinia grow, and then once we get a, a good mat behind it, uh, release some of the salvinia weevils back on top of it. And finally, that leads us into the, the last tool we had, which is biocontrol. And the most effective one we have uh, right now is the giant salvinia weevil. Looking at the latitude of where Lake Raven is, we knew that we or we suspected we would get pretty good survival of the weevils throughout the winter time. Uh, and, and but it, and, and while the weevils had been introduced in the past and, and had not been as successful as we had wished, it was kind of one of those things, well, what would it take to create a weevil population that is successful? Uh, so we were, we were ready to, to do that, you know, whether we pulled those weevils from wild stock elsewhere or if we used them from our greenhouse uh, here at, at the, the fish hatchery in East Texas. So kind of looking at the herbicide treatment stuff, we, we went in and we started looking around and uh, came up with a, an herbicide mix. Uh, actually, it's several mixes here, but uh, the, these are all a combination of a systemic herbicide mixed with a uh, contact herbicide. Uh, the glyphosate, uh, everybody's familiar with that one, but then flumioxazin. This is gonna be a contact herbicide uh, acts just or it kills the, the part of the plant it touches. But the, the interesting thing that we found, and, and we seem to get at least a 90% kill or better with this glyphosate flumioxazin mix, is both herbicides work along the same timeline. So we're looking 10 to 14 days uh, on this timeline, uh, and it, it really does a good job. Uh, in addition to that, we can substitute panoxylum. Uh, this is going to be Gallion is the, the brand name on it. Uh, with the glyphosate, mix that with the flumioxazin, and we'll get a, a good kill as well. Uh, but the one thing the panoxylum gives us uh, advantage is that it can slow regrowth of the salvinia. And then here recently, metsulfuron methyl uh, has been labeled for use uh, on salvinia in the states of Texas and Louisiana. Uh, and we've used uh, the metsulfuron methyl by itself and got okay results. Uh, however, when mixed with the flumioxazin, it seems like it, it does a lot better job. Uh, the unfortunate or the bad thing, I guess, or the negative of the last two are is they can take anywhere from four to six weeks to, for us to see the, the full effect. The other thing we talked about was, okay, let's treat on a more routine basis. Let's, let's uh, take this as a, uh, um, a mowing service. We come out every so often, treat the reservoir for salvinia, water hyacinth, uh, even if we need to do a little bit of hydrilla uh, maintenance at the boat ramp, swim beaches, that type of stuff, we can do it. 
So, uh, you know, kind of looking at this stuff where, you know, we asked the question, anything else we could do. And that's where we came up with the idea that, you know what, it, we need to, to maintain some of this habitat. We need to make sure that we're not uh, killing a lot of unnecessary plants. So we started looking at uh, managing shorelines differently. So in the areas that, with the blue shoreline, and remember those are the areas that we have the campsites, we're gonna treat all salvinia, whether that's a mat of salvinia, a single plant, all of that's getting sprayed. And that's part of that increase in the, the bank access uh, for both people that wanna swim as well as those that wanna fish from the bank. Then the shoreline that's outlined in green, uh, we're only gonna treat mats of salvinia. We're gonna actually let the salvinia be part, become part of the community as it starts to get out of control or before it ever gets out of control, as it starts to mat, we'll, we'll go in and treat those mats, but that's all we're gonna treat. And that would be pretty easy to do uh, you know, on a routine basis every other month. We could just circumnavigate the lake uh, and, and, and treat those areas, those mats in the green. And then it, <clears throat> once we install uh, some booms, then, then those areas back there, the areas in yellow, we wouldn't treat at all for salvinia. That would, that would be part of the weevil's job to do. So kind of getting ahead of ourselves there. Uh, we did go in and we installed some booms. You can see the upper north arm. Uh, it's about a little over nine and a half acres where the eastern arm of it is gonna be a little over an acre and a half. Uh, the booms were gonna provide uh, quite a bit of benefit to us. First of all, they're going to slow the spread of salvinia out of these the backs of these creeks. Uh, the backs of these creeks tend to be uh, have, have lots of uh, lily pads, both American lotus, uh, whitewater lily in it. A lot of the native grasses are back in there. Uh, functions more along the lines of, of, of a swamp or you know, what I guess equivalent of a freshwater estuary back there. Uh, and we didn't want to kill all of that. We wanted to, that was part of that reducing the collateral damage. Uh, so we weren't going to use herbicides back there. Uh, and the booms, what the salvinia was going to spread. So the booms would actually slow the spread of the salvinia by keeping it contained back there. Uh, by doing so, this would decrease overall herbicide use in a heavily utilized uh, water body. Uh, well, obviously we're de decreasing the collateral damage because we're not spraying those areas. And then finally, it gave us an area, a place to where we could release the salvinia weevils and, and see if, if they would work. Could we build that population uh, large enough to where it would control the salvinia? So moving on to the weevils now, uh, in May of 2020, we released right at 5,300 adult salvinia weevils. Uh, these weevils were collected from Lake Nacogdoches, a uh, population that we had been re or built uh, from our greenhouses. Uh, two months later, we went back and we released these. These were in that north arm was the initial. That was the worst of the infestation. We released them there. Uh, if we needed to, we could move them later. Uh, we went back two months later, uh, pulled a sample from that, and we were at uh, five and a half adults uh, per kilogram of plant material and a little over six and a half larva per kilogram of plant material. So we knew we had survival from the initial introduction of them. Fast forward to October of 2020 and the weevils took off. Uh, we need, for control measures, we need about 35 adults per kilogram of, of salvinia to maintain control. In October, our, our sample was at almost 123 adults per kilogram of, of salvinia with 32 and a half larva per kilogram. So we knew we were getting control. Uh, when we went in and actually took the sample, as you would pick the salvinia up, it would crumble in your hands. Uh, during that uh, trip or shortly thereafter, we moved uh, four 30 gallon totes from that north arm over to the east arm. Uh, that was in November. Uh, it, it seemed like everything was going well, and then we got the polar vortex that froze Texas for almost a week. Uh, when it, we got back on the water as soon as we could, uh, got to looking around, and there was hardly any salvinia left uh, in the lake at the time, uh, probably not even enough to, to cover a five-gallon bucket. Uh, so 
we haven't uh, just just left it alone to see what would happen. And then here, November of 2021, went back in and we're seeing adult weevils again and larvae. So it'll be interesting to see how fast this population builds again. So let, now let's do an update, you know, based off of our, our new estimates or our new management strategies. Uh, so picking up from 2018, uh, again, the colors are the same. Uh, however, we're, we're adding a few colors here. The green area uh, boxes represent uh, herbicide treatment days uh, where we treated uh, less than five acres. Uh, the, the yellow is going to be six to 10 acres. Uh, the orange color is going to be that 10 to 20, and then anything above 20 acres will be blue again. So we're starting to see now with some of this, our uh, efforts that we're treating less salvinia throughout the lake uh, than what we had in the past. Uh, you can see in April of uh, 2022, the booms went in. Uh, and then the next month in May of, of 2020, uh, the weevils were, were introduced. Uh, we did one spraying in June of about eight acres. Uh, and then we went back in August uh, to do a follow-up treatment. And I have an asterisk there. Uh, when we got there, the boom in the north arm, that the nine and a half acre section we had uh, boomed off, that boom had uh, come unattached from a tree uh, and was released in Salvinia across the lake. Uh, we went back in September, uh, we treated 13 acres and treated 11 acres. Then again in October, got the Salvinia back under control. Uh, then last November, we were lake-wide two acres. Uh, we did go in in February, right before the, the polar, polar vortex, uh, did a real quick six-acre treatment. And a lot of this is not just salvinia, but salvinia mixed with water hyacinth too. Uh, but if you look, since February, uh, we haven't had a single treatment of uh, salvinia or salvinia water hyacinth mix over five acres. Uh, and then you can see the the... The hydrilla treatment, and again, these last two in 2020 and 2021, these were uh, using Priscillacore. So the results uh, uh, of this, you know, we, we changed our management philosophy, you know, did it work? I would tend to tell you, yeah. Uh, typically, we have less than five acres total coverage of Salvinia Lakewide. Uh, State Park shoreline, the blue shoreline that we wanted to maintain uh, for camping access, uh, fishing, and, and any waiting around swimming. We don't have any access issues in these areas now from uh, Giant Salvinia. Uh, the non-state park shorelines, the, the areas in green where we weren't, we were leaving the Salvinia, but only treating as a mat. We don't have any mats. And we have lots of beneficial aquatic vegetation over there, both native and even some non-native hydrilla that, that is providing some benefit to the central arcade fishery in the reservoir. And then finally, the weevils. Uh, we, we suspected that the weevils would survive the winter, uh, but now we know. We know they're capable of surviving single digits uh, in Texas out there. And, and we know historically that this weevil population is capable of rapid growth. So now that, that takes us to, you know, it seems like everything's a success on this, everything works, but there's always problems or, or concerns uh, that we had. Uh, one of them, you know, I, I discussed just a second ago, the winter dieback of the weevils. Well, we observed the survival, uh, <clears throat> but right now it appears that we may have a slow recovery. Uh, however, in the past, though, like I said, we did see a large uh, inc or increase in that weevil population in just a short period of time. We know that the booms break loose or, or, or come loose or, or even will break. Uh, it's about two hours from our office, so if we ever have an issue like that, we could get there pretty quick and address that. Uh, but the lake is small enough that we can rapidly uh, regain control of Salvinia if that ever becomes a problem. Now, one of the issues that we experienced this year was uh, we had the Salvinia weevils in there. We've been treating Salvinia uh, and, and kind of keeping it back. Well, now the water hyacinth flourished in the areas behind uh, the booms. Uh, one of the things we've come up with now is, uh, you know, we can go in, we know 2,4-D is going to have minimal impacts on the salvinia. Uh, so we can go in and use 2,4-D uh, on the water hyacinth uh, as needed. 
or what we're doing now is waiting for the winter to have occur. So that way all of our native stuff senesces back and then we can go in and, and pick on the water hyacinth and, and have just minimal damage to our native species. Uh, one of the biggest problems though is John Sylvania is probably never gonna go away. Eradication is almost gonna be impossible at this point, but we have it under control. It's not, it's not an access issue for, for boaters, for swimmers, for anglers, anybody. And we've gotten beat Salvinia back to the point now it's just a, a small par portion of the community back there. Uh, and, you know, because we know we can't eradicate it, now, now our management, go our objective is to, our strategy is just to manage or control that. And that's what we're doing. Now, the last one, and this one is always a concern when you have a non-native species in a water body, is that plant moving to another water body. Uh, the broke ramp is, is on that state park shoreline. That's the one that's being uh, sprayed heavily. Uh, and, and and we're not worried about uh, collateral or collateral damage on, on that shoreline. That's that blue shoreline there. So we know the boat ramp's getting treated uh, every time we're going out there. We're not waiting for mats. We're getting individual plants too. But the other thing we've done with Parks and Wildlife on this is is our outreach. Uh, we've got a couple of, of campaigns that we're doing. Uh, billboards. You'll see the clings on the. Uh, beverage coolers in the convenience stores. You fill up with gas on top of the gas pumps. You're, you'll see the little placards. Uh, and this is uh, the protect the lakes you love uh, idea. And, and what we've done with Parks and Wildlife on this campaign is almost issued a challenge to the, the, the public out there as, you know, we need your help. Let's protect your lakes. And, and by let's, that means both Parks and Wildlife and, and the public themselves. In addition to that, we also uh, have clean, drain, dry signs uh, at the boat ramps. And then finally, too, at each of these boat ramps, we have boat ramp stencils, like the one you see in the picture here, Stop Invasive Species, the Clean, Drain, Dry logo. And then what it's also, too, in Texas, it is the law to clean and drain your boats. Uh, possession of... Uh, Salvini on your boat trailer is a class C misdemeanor punishable by up to a $500 fine. Uh, so, uh, and, then, and then we also have signs at the boat ramps too uh, as you're coming up. So if you, you don't see this big uh, four foot by six foot uh, stencil on the boat ramp, there's also colored sign, or colorful signs at the ramps to remind you to clean, drain, drain and dry your boat. Uh, with that, uh, you know, obviously we, or this picture was uh, taken from uh, the post freeze. You can see the dead salvini in the middle, the brown, and then the, the new growth uh, surrounding it. Uh, but, you know, this is one of the things we realize that we're going to have to do. And whether that's Lake Raven or, or any of the other lakes in Texas, uh, salvini is here to stay. So with that, uh, that's the end of the presentation and I'll take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, John. That was a great presentation. Um, we don't have any questions Thanks. in the chat right now. Oh, it looks like we just got one. Um, how sustainable is frequent treatment for control for this reservoir and or expand to multiple reservoirs? Uh, for us, we can sustain this. Uh, we can do this annually. Um, right now, we're on about every six to eight week rotation with uh, this reservoir. Uh, total for the reservoirs that, that we're responsible for, uh, there's, we're probably in a neighborhood of around 60, uh, some reservoirs. Now, some of them aren't uh, as problematic. Some, not all of them have giant salvinia in it. Uh, some of it's a water hyacinth issue. We can go in, treat that, come back three or four weeks or months later and treat again. So, I mean, we're able to manage 60 plus reservoirs uh, with aquatic vegetation issues and, and you know, do this on, on a frequent treatment uh, basis. Awesome. That's great. Other questions for John? Uh, I actually have a question. Um, 
Just, mm -hmm. cu just curious if, um, since there are multiple uh, non-native plant species, do you ever see that if you knock one of them back, like another one expands more or do you have any issues like that? Yeah, we do. And, and that's what was surprising this year with water hyacinth was it got so cold here in Texas. I, it was single digits out in, in Huntsville and Lake Raven. And it definitely pushed the salvinia back and, and it kept it in check for a long time. But we saw an explosion statewide in water hyacinth. Uh, we know that the adult hyacinth probably froze back and died. But a lot of that seed bank that had remained dormant for years all of a sudden exploded. So whether it was Lake Raven or other states or other lakes across the state, uh, yeah, we did see that. Gotcha. Interesting. Other questions? Feel free to put questions in the chat or at this point, um, feel free to also just unmute yourself and ask. All right, looks like we got another one. What are the impacts to any native aquatic veg from the salvinia and from treatment? Uh, from the salvinia, we, we've got it at such a level now that we're not having any impacts or very minimal impacts on native vegetation. Uh, and that's, that's kind of why we went in and, and broke up the shorelines into the state park or the shoreline that borders the campsites, that one, it's, it's okay if we get rid of some of the native stuff there too, because uh, there's a lot of people that, that do swim and fish there. That was one of the things that the state park asked is that, uh, you know, we keep that area clean. A lot of folks, uh, when, when they come up and to, to camp at the lake, uh, they don't want the icky plants touching their legs whenever they're swimming. So that's one of the areas. I mean, that whole area that I had in the blue, let me see if I can go back to that, that slide. Yep, here we go. This one. So the whole area in blue, we can go in and treat without worry of of native vegetation and that type of stuff. But it's all of this green stuff. Uh, what is roughly well over right about five miles of shoreline that's where we're only going to treat the mats of salvinia and what we're calling a mat is something about the size of our airboat uh so if it's not that big i mean if it's just a few individual plants we're, we're moving on past it gotcha Okay, another question. What herbicide mix of the three you mentioned are you using as your standard for giant sylvania? The standard is gonna, we're using as the glyphosate mix with the flumioxazin. And that one, it, we're, we're seeing probably 90% uh, kill on the first treatment with that. Uh, and it happens quick. It's anywhere from 10 to 14 days. The other two, the panoxylum flumioxazin and metsulfuron methyl flumioxazin, <clears throat> While they work well, it takes anywhere from four to six weeks for you to see the full impact of those. Awesome. Not to mention, too, the glyphosate flumioxidant is the cheapest of, of the three. It's, it's probably half the cost of the panoxylum flumioxidant mix. Always a plus. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yes, I'll ask another question. Um, and again, I was sorry, I was late. So if you talked about this in the beginning, um, sorry, I missed it. But I'm curious about whether it's easier to get. Um, like approval to apply mixes or single uh, pesticides, insect or herbicides. Do you have any kind of like policy constraints on what kinds of combinations you can use in this area? First and foremost, you got to go to the herbicide label. Uh, on the labels, uh, it will tell you if you can mix those herbicides. 
uh, and then it'll give you recommendations, uh, you know, as to what it can be mixed with. There's some of the herbicides you're not going to want to mix into your tank because uh, it'll either make a gel or uh, with some of the, the older spray hands we have within the department have said if uh, I forget what it exactly was, but it was 2,4-D mixed with something else would so we'll pretty much make a brick uh, in your uh, spray tank. So first and foremost, check the herbicide labels. Uh, and see if it's been approved to uh, use with another herbicide. Uh, otherwise, it, it's just kind of our thought process. We actually went back and started looking up information on how do these herbicides work. We didn't want anything working, two herbicides working against each other with it. And on the flumioxazin label, uh, both uh, Clipper and the Samara, it'll tell you that you can mix it with uh, 2,4-D, Diquat, uh, Panoxylum as well as glyphosate. And in terms of like state and federal permits or approvals that, that you need to be able to apply all of these, any mix that um, that is fine based on those labels, you don't have a problem getting correct. Permission. Correct. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I think I'll go ahead and, and close this out if there are no more questions from anyone. Um, just kidding, there's one more. <laughs> Um, do you consider a drawdown as a management action? Yes, uh, that we do. Uh, currently, the the lake is being is drawn down right now. Uh, the state park is uh, working on the dam. Uh, they did a drawdown in the past. Uh, now, on this reservoir, because it's so small, it doesn't take a whole lot of water to uh, draw it down to the point that it really restricts use. So that's why the park has done it in the the this time of year uh, or in the winter is aquatic use other than boats. I mean, we're not having people swimming or that type of stuff. Uh, so they're not being impacted. That That's part of the reason they did the choice. But otherwise, the, the park wants to see the reservoir at, at full pull as much as possible, just because it's such a popular destination. Great. Uh, another question. Are there any costs associated with getting the weevils? Uh, we we actually have uh, folks here on staff that uh, uh, Thomas runs three different greenhouses uh, rearing weevils. So yeah, I mean there's some cost with it. You have to, you know, the cost of the greenhouse as well as the tanks. Uh, you've got to be able to, you know, maintain water, uh, you know, electricity or a pump or whatever at that point in time. Uh, however, you know, with uh, a, a, a single harvest out of our greenhouses, we did one a couple weeks ago. It, we, we were at almost 67,000 uh, adult salvinia weevils being released and right at 33,000 larvae uh, based on our, our counts and extrapolated out based on the total weight that was moved from the greenhouses out into the reservoir. So, you know, we're at almost 100,000 on it. Uh, what that cost is per weevil, I don't know, uh, but I mean, it's not, it's not that high. That's awesome. Um, is there any collateral damage to native plants from the weevils? No, 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 no. Uh, that's a great question. Before any organism can be used as a biocontrol agent in the United States, it has to go through uh, testing of, from USDA and that, that testing can take three to four years. They're going to make sure that this new uh, biocontrol agent isn't going to destroy things like cotton and corn or major crops uh, or species of concern that we have, as well as, you know, some of our native stuff or all of our native stuff. Uh, the Salvinia weevil is species specific. Uh, it will, the adults will chew or eat uh, common salvinia, which we also have here in Texas, but the common salvinia uh, 
the stems of it are, are too small of a diameter to be able to allow the uh, giant salvinia weevil larva to to live. The larva is actually a larger diameter than the the stem of that plant. Uh, I, I, like we tell everybody here, I mean, based off of USDA's testing, and uh, you could take these weevils into uh, Whole Foods or, or the best of organic grocery stores out there uh, with the the best possible food, throw them out onto that, and they would starve. So I wouldn't recommend taking a handful of weevils and throwing them in a grocery store. But if you did, just know that they wouldn't cause any damage to any other plants. It's good to know. <laughs> awesome. More questions. We do have about 10 more minutes, so feel free to ask away. All right, is there any active restoration of native aquatic vegetation as part of this integrated pest management plan? Uh, not on this reservoir. And it's just because the native plants have returned so so much. Uh, I don't have the latest uh, vegetation survey, uh, but our management offices, our fish management offices conduct those at least once every four years. Uh, when we're out there spraying, I mean, we have lots and lots of native plants. Uh, or even I bulrush uh, acres of it. We have acres of American pond weed, uh, the pickerel weed, uh, the water willow, the American lotus. Uh, all in the backs of each one of these little coves, we have those plant species. I mean, just acres and acres of it. Awesome. So as as far as you know, having to do a native plant on this one, no. But there are some other lakes in our state that we have had to come back in and, and do some native planting stuff. Gotcha. Any more questions? All right. Not seeing anything else. Um, so thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. Uh, this webinar was recorded, as you know, and it will be made available on the CCAS YouTube page. Um, I'm throwing, I'm gonna throw some links here in there. Yeah, so on our YouTube channel, it'll be available. Um, by the end of the day tomorrow, most likely. Uh, also encourage you all to visit our CCAS site and our dashboard where we have, as of today, 129 case studies. We're continuing to work on lining up other webinar speakers for the coming months. Um, so please contact me if you would like to receive those announcements and aren't already on our mailing list. We thank you all for our time and especially you, John, for joining us to give this excellent presentation. Hope you all have a great day.